<clears throat> hey everyone, today Rebecca and I are going to explain one of the most remarkable negative results in economics, the Meyerson Sedathwaite theorem. In short, the theorem says that there um, can be trade situations when no mechanism exists that can ensure efficient trade between two individuals. Our video is structured as followed. First we're gonna introduce an exemplary situation with which we're gonna work with throughout the whole video. Then we're going to um, explain the theorem and its conditions and then we're going to prove it. And you can find the timestamps in the description of the video below. This is going to be our example. Rebecca is trying to sell her car to Adrian, me. Both seller, Rebecca and buyer have private information about their utilities, meaning only they know how much they value the car. We assume that we, in our example, the typical buyer and seller, can have different valuations of the car respectively. What do we mean by this? Let's look at our high-value buyer. Adrian can be a banker who is pretty well off and is therefore willing to pay a high amount of money for the car. We assume this is 10,000 euros. However, Adrian could be a cyclist and wants to buy a car only for some occasions. Naturally, the cyclist values the car lower than the banker does. So the cyclist is willing to pay only 1,000 euros for the car. Same goes for our seller. We assume that Rebecca wants to sell her deceived grandmother's car. Because it has a great emotional value for her, she wants 9,000 euros for it. This valuation is higher than the one of this Rebecca who sells her ex-boyfriend's car. She just wants to get rid of it and would even be happy to sell it for zero euros. What happens when Rebecca and Adrian meet? On what price will they settle? Again, Adrian does not know whether Rebecca is the type that wants to sell her grandmother's car or if she wants to sell her ex-boyfriend's car. Also, Rebecca does not know whether Adrian is a cyclist or a banker. They just know that the other one is either one of the two types. What happens when the low value types now meet? This would be Rebecca who is selling her ex-boyfriend's car and Adrian the cyclist. They will trade because Adrian's valuation is higher than Rebecca's and they will settle for a price between 0 and 1000 because these are their respective valuations. But what happens if Rebecca the one who is selling her ex-boyfriend's car and Adrian who is now the banker meet? They will trade too. Adrian's valuation is now even higher and of course also still higher than Rebecca's valuation and they will settle for a price between 0 and 10,000. What happens when the high value types meet? This would be Rebecca who is selling her grandmother's car and Adrian the banker. Again they will trade because Adrian's valuation is higher than Rebecca's. They will settle for a price between 9,000 and 10,000 euros. But what happens if Rebecca, the one who is selling her grandmother's car and therefore has a high valuation and Adrian, the cyclist who has a low valuation meet? They will then not trade. Adrian's valuation is now lower than Rebecca's valuation. And that is why no trade should take place and no trade will take place. So the myerson satterthwaite theorem now says that there are situations where no mechanism exists that is interim individual rational, budget balance, incentive compatible and can ensure efficient trade. So now let's take a closer look at the different conditions to understand what the theorem actually says. Interim individual rational means that the individuals want to participate in the game, knowing how the mechanism, wo mechanism works and what their valuations are. That means that their expected valuation, so what they expect to get out of the trade, is not negative. Budget balanced means that no one has to stick in some extra money, meaning no one has to pay the individuals to trade. In an incentive compatible mechanism, each individual can maximize his or her expected utility by reporting his or her true valuation, given that the other one reports honestly too. So no incentive exists to state an untrue value. Efficiency in this case means that trade always takes place when it should, meaning when the valuation of the buyer is higher than the valuation of the seller. The myerson satterthwaite theorem now says that a mechanism where all of these three conditions hold does not exist. And this result is very meaningful for economic thought, because classical price theory actually does not take into account the process of bargaining and simply says that traders just like that achieve all possible gains from trade. A famous example of classical price theory is the Coase theorem. It says that once property rights are clarified, the parties can then negotiate efficiently to regulate the externality and therefore reach an efficient allocation. The myerson satterthwaite theorem in contrast says that it's actually not that easy and that the parties may not be able to efficiently regulate the externality. 
all in all, the myers incentive weight result is quite different from classical theory because it says that trading cannot always be efficient. I mean, ask yourselves, have you ever walked away from a bargain where you initially thought that it would be possible that you could trade? Well, bargains are not always efficient. Examples for that could be labor strikes, could be uh, lawsuits, or even some wars are examples of bargaining failures. This is why the myers incentive weight theorem is so important. It highlights information asymmetry as a cause of inefficiency. So as long as people have private information about their willingness to do something, it's going to be very difficult to achieve efficiency. So now in order to prove the theorem, we're looking for a mechanism where all three conditions hold. Let's just start with a specific one. Rebecca names a price for her car and I either walk away or buy at that price. Rebecca does not know whether Adrian is the cyclist or the banker. Therefore, she will name a price of either 1000 or 10,000 euros because that makes most sense for her. These are the maximum amounts that both Adrian's, the cyclist and the banker are willing to pay respectively. We now take a look at Rebecca who is selling her ex-boyfriend's car. She wants to trade and does not know whether she is confronted with the cyclist or the banker. The probability of meeting either one is 50%. Which price should she name? 1000 or 10,000? That depends on which one yields the highest expected value. What will happen when Rebecca names a price of 1000? Well, the banker will happily buy the car. Also the cyclist, he will buy the car as well. So Rebecca's expected value therefore is, with a 50% probability she will meet the banker and the cyclist both respectively and both times she will for sure get 1000. So her overall expected value by naming a price of 1000 is 1000. So what will happen if Rebecca names a price of 10,000? Well, for the banker, he would definitely buy the car. However, the cyclist, he wouldn't be interested and would not buy the car. So her expected value is 0.5 times zero for the cyclist not buying the car plus 0.5 times 10,000 for the banker buying the car, which results in 5,000 expected value. Which price does Rebecca choose? Well, the one that yields the higher expected value, which is 10,000 euros. We compare 5,000 expected value to 1,000 expected value. So Rebecca, who sells her ex-boyfriend's car, she will always name the price of 10,000. Though the three conditions hold, the allocation that is reached is inefficient. That is because trade between the cyclist and Rebecca who is selling her ex-boyfriend's car does not take place. But as we can see, trade between them actually should take place. Because the cyclist's valuation is higher than Rebecca's valuation for the car. So if they would trade, they would both be better off. If instead the specific mechanism was designed so that Adrian and not Rebecca would name the price, the same inefficiency would occur. So it doesn't matter which party has the bargaining power in the game, because the allocation will be inefficient either way. So we have to continue our search for a mechanism. What about a different mechanism that somehow leads to the seller offering a lower price than 10,000? For that we now look at a more general form of mechanism and um, test again if this leads to an efficient outcome and if all conditions hold. We assume again that condition 1 and 2 um, are satisfied so we only have to check for condition 3. The cyclist could go to Rebecca and say, well, too bad, I'm the cyclist, you should trade with me for 1000. The problem is, the banker could do the same thing, pretending to be the cyclist and therefore getting a better price. But also, the Rebecca who is selling her ex-boyfriend's car could go to um, Adrian and say, she's selling her grandmother's car and therefore get a higher price. But for the mechanism we're looking for, we need the buyer and the seller to reveal their valuations for the car truthfully. So to test whether the buyer and the seller have incentives to lie, let's first take a look at the possible prices. Okay, let's look into all trade situations that could occur. Um, if the banker and Rebecca with her grandmother's car meet, then a price of at least 9,000 will happen. Uh, if cyclist and Rebecca with her ex-boyfriend's car meet, there the price would not be more than 1000. And if the cyclist and Rebecca with her grandmother's car meet, 
there will be no trade. Okay. If the banker and Rebecca with her ex-boyfriend's car meet, the price will be somewhere between zero and 10,000. This unknown price has to make sure that both Adrian and Rebecca will not lie. Okay, so let's dive into the mind of the banker because he's the one who might have an incentive to lie and pretend to be the cyclist. When choosing if he's going to lie or not, he would compare the expected value he gets out of lying to the expected value he gets out of telling the truth. And his expected value of telling the truth is the following equation. So we know that with 50% probability he will meet each of the versions of Rebecca. So his value in the end, so what he gets out of the trade, is his valuation for the car, which is 10,000, minus the price he has to pay for it. So in the first part of the equation we have the banker who is denoted with 10,000 of value meeting Rebecca who is uh, Rebecca who is selling her ex-boyfriend's car which is denoted with a value of zero. So this explains the numbers and brackets behind the price. In the second part of the equation the banker with his valuation of 10,000 meets Rebecca who is selling her grandmother's car with a valuation of 9,000 for the price. The expected value of lying is the following equation. So again, with 50% probability, he will meet each version of Rebecca. And his value in the end is again his valuation of 10,000 minus the price he has to pay. But this time, the banker pretends to be a cyclist. So in our trade situation, we would have a banker pretending to be a cyclist meeting with each version of Rebecca. But Rebecca will, will then think that the banker is a cyclist. So in our first part of the equation, we have a price that results from the cyclist meeting with Rebecca who is selling her ex-boyfriend's car and then the second part of the equation we again have the price that results from the cyclist meeting with Rebecca who is selling her grandmother's car. The price when the banker and Rebecca who is selling her ex-boyfriend's car meet cannot be higher than 2000 because otherwise then the banker would have an incentive to pretend to be a cyclist. Now we're diving into the mind of the Rebecca who is selling her ex-boyfriend's car and she compares the expected value of lying to telling the truth. The expected value of telling the truth has to be higher and we already talked about the prices. We solve this equation the same way we did it uh, the first time uh, for the unknown price and we find out that it cannot be lower than 8,000 euros. Otherwise, uh, Rebecca um, would lie. We need a price that is below 2000 for Adrian and above 8000 for Rebecca. This doesn't work. That's a, it's impossible to satisfy the third uh, requirement, the, the, the third condition for both of them at the same time. Our mechanism, our general mechanism doesn't work. So what we did was that we tested a specific mechanism and the more general form of a mechanism. The first one, the specific mechanism, did not lead to an efficient allocation. And the second one, the more general form of a mechanism, did not meet the required condition of incentive compatibility. So from this we can conclude that no mechanism exists that can assure an efficient trade, so that trade always takes place when it should, under the given conditions. And this is the proof for the myerson setup wave theorem. When buyers and sellers have private information about their valuations, an efficient allocation cannot always be reached. This is because there exists no mechanism that could guarantee an efficient trade in this situation with asymmetric information. Now you might say Rebecca could just sell her car to someone else, or Adrian could just go and find a car somewhere else, right, that's right. The more competition there is, the less we have this problem of asymmetrical information. So at the extreme, in a perfectly competitive market, no one has an impact on the market price. This means the buyer makes an efficient decision to buy whenever his own valuation is higher than the market price and vice versa for the seller. So in that sense, the market solves the, solves the problem. But isn't it noteworthy how hard it is to get things started? We just saw that it can be impossible to organize the most basic form of an economic interaction, that is, two persons bargaining over the exchange of one single good. Crazy!